Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another great edition of Ed Puzzle Lecture Notes. Today, we're going to go on to a little farther in the muscular system. We're going to go over the anatomy of muscle fibers, go over them a little bit closer. The proteins, fibers, the filaments that are involved in making up what's called the sarcomeres, the functional unit of skeletal muscles. All right, so hopefully you guys remember from way back in the nervous system an action potential. That is when a, a neuron is actually firing, it's, it's sending a nerve impulse. Well, these are the efferent, those motor neurons that's coming from the central nervous system and it's going to innervate or connect to a muscle. So you can see right down here, this little motor neuron right here, this efferent neuron, its axon terminals are connecting to, or what's called innervating. Innervating just means has a connection with, and it's connecting with those individual muscle fibers or muscle cells. All right, so that brings us to a motor unit. A motor unit is a single motor neuron, and all of the muscle fibers are the muscle cells that it stimulates. So one motor neuron will have the job of innervating or connecting with several. I mean, in the biceps, you can see they can connect with over 2,000 muscle fibers or muscle cells. And that's, what that's because your biceps do what's called a gross movement. You're not doing fine, fine, precise movements with your biceps. You're usually lifting something rather he heavy. But like other muscles, like say in your fingertips or, or in your eyes, those have to do very precise movements, very exact. So in there, those motor neurons are going to innervate or connect with far fewer muscle fibers because they need to do more precise, more exact movements. All right, now just a little image of a typical motor unit. So remember, this is the dorsal root. So this is where the sensory information comes in through the dorsal or the back, posterior side of the spinal cord. And then they're going to connect to, we have two motor neurons here. They're going to lead through the ventral root out of the spinal cord. And you can see these, this motor neuron here in green, it's going to branch off in its axon terminals. That's going to form one motor unit. And then this purple one here, it's going to branch off and innervate its own different muscle fibers. So those two motor neurons, they do not connect with the same muscle fibers. They connect with their own muscle fibers. So each of these cells, this is a cell right here made up of the sarcomeres, they're just innervated or connected with a single motor neuron. So these two lighter shaded muscle fibers, that will make it along with its motor neuron will make a motor unit. All right, so now some proteins, the various proteins which make up the structure of muscles and uh, in particular, specifically the sarcomeres. Will you need to know all these? I have no idea. I would say probably not. Now the first two, myosin and actin, the contractile proteins, so those are those thick and thin filaments. So you can see that down here, down here in red, those would be the thin filaments. And in the middle of the sarcomere in blue, those would be the thick filaments, the myosin. So remember, the thin filaments are actin. The thick filaments are the myosin. Now, those you'll certainly need to know because those are the ones that slide past each other to allow the muscle to contract or shorten in length. Two others you'll probably almost certainly need to know is called troponin and tropomyosin. Now, we'll go over those a little bit more here in a second, but those are the regulatory proteins. So it is troponin. Once an action potential from a motor neuron reaches the muscle, troponin will bond with calcium ions. And when calcium ions bonds to the protein troponin, it causes tropomyosin to change its shape. And you can barely see tropomyosin down here. When tropomyosin changes its shape, it allows these heads or these cross bridges on the thick filaments, the myosin, to latch on to the thin filaments and actually pull it. So it's going to pull the thin filaments over the thick filaments. So troponin and tropomyosin, which I said we're going, to, we're going to go over it more here in a second, so I don't expect you to really understand this right now. But those four are going to be really important. Myosin, the thick filaments. Actin, the thin filaments. Troponin and tropomyosin, 
Those are the ones that actually allow the thick and thin filaments to slide past each other to cause contraction. Now these other proteins down here, I don't know, maybe Titan. So Titan, you're going to see it's down here. It's in green. And basically Titan, it acts as like an anchor. It's going to anchor the thick filaments, the myosin, to those Z discs or the Z line right there. So that's what's going to anchor the thick filaments to both ends of the sarcomere, the Z discs or the Z line. Myomesin, doubt you'll need to know this. That's another protein that helps to anchor the thick filaments, the myosin, to the M line, or the very middle of the sarcomere. Nebulin is another just structural protein. You can barely see it right in here in green. And it's just a structural protein that helps to keep the thin filaments aligned properly. And the last one is dystrophin. It's not really pictured here, but it is a protein strand that goes from the thin filaments and it connects, let me do a different color, let's go blue, it's going to connect to the sarcolemma, it's going to connect to the cell membrane. So when, that, when those muscle fibers actually move, when they contract, that's what actually transfers that movement to the actual muscle itself. So the, the thick and thin filaments aren't just sliding past each other and nothing's happening. It is that dystrophin that actually transfers that movement, the contraction of those uh, myofibrils, and actually transfers it to the sarcolemma or the cell membrane, which allows the entire muscle to move. And now just some basic terms that you're going to want to get down in your notes. Neuromuscular junction, that basically describes exactly what it is. Neuromuscular, so this is where a neuron, a motor neuron, and the actual muscle fibers or muscle cells junction or come together. So it is where the axon terminals of a muscle neuron or a motor neuron is going to is going to connect with the sarcolemma or the cell membrane of a muscle fiber or cell. Now, the precise area on the sarcolemma or the cell membrane of that muscle fiber or cell where the axon terminals actually connect, that's called the motor end plate. So that's basically the site where the axon terminals of a motor neuron is going to connect with the cell membrane or the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber itself. Axon terminals, hopefully you remember that from the nervous system. Branching ends of a motor neuron. They contain the synaptic end bulbs. Those are the little kind of like bubbles within the axon terminals that contain the synaptic vesicles, which are filled with the neurotransmitters. And in the case of skeletal muscles, the neurotransmitter that's going to excite or get the muscle to actually contract is a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. So if an action potential travels down that motor neuron, that motor neuron, the synaptic vesicles, are going to release their neurotransmitters into the space between the muscle itself and the motor neuron, and those neurotransmitters are going to be acetylcholine, and that'll cause the muscle to contract. And here's synaptic cleft, that is just the space between the axon terminals from the motor neuron and a muscle fiber itself. And just a little diagram of the NMJ or the neuromuscular junction region. So here you can see this is the motor or efferent neuron. It is innervating or connecting with a muscle fiber, muscle cell here. Here's a Schwann cell, if you remember that from the nervous system, that's what creates the myelin around the axon of neurons in the peripheral nervous system. Now, right here, you can see a little bit closer view. Here is the area of the sarcolemma on the uh, muscle cell. That's the motor end plate. That's the region where the muscle is, is uh, in close contact with the, the axon terminals of the motor neuron. In between is a tiny, tiny little space. That's the synaptic cleft. So that's where the, neuro, the neurotransmitters are going to be released. Down here, you can see that. So here's the synapse, the space between the muscle cell and the axon terminals or synaptic end bulb of the motor neuron. Here you can see the synaptic vesicles, those little pink things in there. That's acetylcholine. That's, that's the neurotransmitter that's going to stimulate the muscle. 
So when that action potential travels down that motor neuron, it causes these synaptic vesicles to bind with the membrane of the synaptic end bulb and release the neurotransmitters into the synapse. Now those neurotransmitters, they fit into these little receptor proteins. So remember, this is a ligand-gated channel because the channels are opened by these special little keys, the little neurotransmitters. All right, now kind of the complicated story of how do muscles actually contract. Well, of course, it's going to start with a motor neuron being stimulated. So that motor neuron is going to send an action potential down the motor neuron until it reaches its synaptic end bulbs, the axon terminals. That's where it's going to connect with the muscle itself, the neuromuscular junction. When that action potential reaches the muscle, it's going to release that neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, into the synapse. And it says here it's important to know that acetylcholine is diffusing across the synaptic cleft, so it's not active transport. Active transport requires energy from the cell. It needs ATP to move those substances. Diffusion is the movement of a substance without the use of any energy from the cell, so it, it happens all by itself. I don't know if that's important or not, but it's in here. So anyways, uh, the acetylcholine is going to activate those ACH or acetylcholine receptors. That's going to, just like in, in neurons, that's going to cause those voltage-gated sodium channels to open to allow sodium to flow in, and then once again for potassium to flow out. Now, this inflow of sodium ions into the sarcolemma and especially down those transverse tubules. So remember, the sarcolemma is like this, the sarcomere, and those, those T tubules actually go down into the muscle itself, so that's allowing that action potential to get deep into the, the muscle fibers. Now, if no more ACH is needed, it's not going to stay there forever. It's broken down by an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase acetylcholine esterase, and that's if no more impulse is needed. Basically, the muscle is going to go back to relaxing, so that ACH has to go somewhere, and it's broken down by an enzyme. I doubt you'll need to know that. All right, so now that action potential has reached, reached the muscle. It's going down those T tubules, those transverse tubules that go deep into the muscle, deep into the, the uh, sarcomeres, and that stimulates the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release those calcium ions into the sarcoplasm or like the fluid within the muscle cell or muscle fiber. Now it is those calcium ions that bind to the protein troponin. Troponin, remember, is on the thin filaments and it, it is going to cause tropomyosin to move and change its shape. Now tropomyosin has the role it blocks these binding sites on the actin or the thin filaments. It blocks it. It doesn't allow the heads or the cross bridges on the myosin, the thick filaments, to grab on to the binding site and move or slide the actin or thin filaments. So that tropomyosin blocks it. But when the calcium bonds to troponin, it causes tropomyosin to change its shape. And now those, so like, the, the myosin has like these things, they're kind of like a golf club. They have these little heads. And when the tropomyosin moves, it allows those heads, those cross bridges, to attach to the binding sites on the actin and then slide it. And that's what's going to cause the muscle to actually contract. So the calcium bonds to troponin, which causes tropomyosin to change its shape, revealing the binding sites, allowing myosin to attach onto actin and pull it or slide it. Now, for the, for the uh, heads or the cross bridges of myosin to actually pull the actin to, to slide it past, it's going to take ATP energy. Remember, this is, the, this is the energy molecule, ATP. ATP hydrolysis, that just means ATP is getting broken apart using water, and it also use, uses an enzyme, ATPase enzyme, to split ATP ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate because it has three phosphates. And it's going to convert it from ATP into ADP. So it's going to remove one of those phosphates. 
And whenever that happens, whenever you convert ATP into ADP, it releases energy. And that energy is going to be used by the, the cross bridges or those, the myosin heads, the thing that looks like a little golf club, to actually pull on the actin to move it. And that's basically what this next one says. The cross bridges, it's going to release the phosphate as it, as it bonds to the binding sites on the actin or the thin filaments. And then you're going to have what's called the power stroke. So the power stroke is where the myosin head is going to rotate and release the ADP. And that rotation of the myosin head is going to cause the thin filaments to slide towards the middle, both thin filaments on both sides of the sarcomere to start sliding towards the middle or towards the H zone. Remember, the H zone is the zone of the sarcomere that contains only thick filaments. And the last step to get that, to get that cross bridge or that head of the myosin fiber to detach, it will take another ATP. So another ATP bonds to the, the head of the myosin and that'll cause it to detach, or if, if further contraction is needed, it can repeat the steps and cause the, the muscle to contract even more. And now step seven. So now that the, this SR, that's for sarcoplasmic reticulum, it has released a lot of its calcium ions, and that's what's causing the muscle to contract in the first place. Because remember that those calcium, those Ca2 plus ions, they're, they're binding with the troponin to cause the tropomyosin to change its shape, which allows the myosin, the thick filaments, to attach to the active sites on the, on the actin and slide it forward. Well, now we need, to get that, we need to get those calcium ions back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum in preparation for another muscle contraction. And in this case, it's not going to be diffusion. This time it's going to be active transport. Active transport, so this does require energy. So... The cell is going to use ATP energy in special protein pumps to pump calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, back into storage. Uh, uh, the sarcoplasmic reticulum also has this calcium binding protein called calciquestrin. And basically that's like a protein that bonds with calcium. So that calciquestrin helps to keep all of these calcium ions inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum, because if you know anything about diffusion, things always want to move from high concentration to low concentration. Well, there's an extremely high concentration of calcium ions inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum, so those calcium ions want to get out, but these calcium binding proteins help to keep that the level of calcium ions very high inside the SR, or the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All right, so now once the calcium goes away, there's no more calcium or very low levels of calcium inside the sarcolemma. So now this is where the tropomyosin is going to slide back. It's going to cover those binding sites on the actin again. So those cross bridges, the heads on, on the myosin can no longer grab onto the actin and pull it. And that's what causes the muscle to relax. All right, not really much to say on this one. Uh, because it's really hard to understand how this works when you're just looking at a bunch of words. We need pictures, and we're going to have pictures on the next slide. So just remember, it's the myosin and those cross bridges. So myosin, they have these little heads, the heads on it, and those, that's what forms the cross bridges. They're going to latch onto the thin filaments, the actin, and then they're going to change shape and pull that actin towards the center of the sarcomere, shortening its overall length. So this is where, the, remember the Z-discs, the sarcomere goes from Z-disc to Z-disc. That's where the actin, the thin filaments, are anchored. And of course, we're going to see, hopefully these next pictures in this video I'm going to show you will make this a lot clearer. Remember, it is those thin filaments are the ones that are sliding inward. So if this was one side of a sarcomere and this is the other side, those are the thin filaments. And I'll go blue. Thick filaments in the middle. So it is these thin filaments that are going to slide toward the H zone or towards the M line. M line. So that's what's going to cause this sarcomere to contract or shorten in length. And it is that those contractions, when they are skeletal muscles, they will pull on the bones, and that's what actually causes 
skeletal muscles to actually allow us to move. Okay, not the best picture in the world, but let's see what we can do with this. So up top here, we have two sarcomeres. This is a relaxed muscle. So here, you can see the thick filaments in red. Probably shouldn't use red, but that's right there. You can see the thin filaments here in green. Here's the Z-line to Z-line, so that's one sarcomere. Here's another Z-line, so that's a second sarcomere. Now, when this thing starts to contract, you can see the thick filaments here. There's the myosin, those little things sticking out right there. Those are the cross bridges. Those are the heads. So when this thing's ready to contract, they're going to bind onto the, the binding sites of this actin, and they're going to start pulling the actin towards the middle, both sides. So this one, they're going to bind on. The cross bridge is going to bind on to the actin. Remember, that's when the tropomyosin moves because... Troponin bonding with calcium causes tropomyosin to move, which allows those cross bridges to bind on and then pull those thin actin fibers towards the M line. So here's a partially contracted muscle. You can see where these actin fibers have been pulled because here, let me change colors, here we had a fairly large space. You can see here they have moved much closer together because these cross bridges are, are grabbing onto the actin and pulling them towards the middle, causing the muscle to shorten in length. Here, you can see here the, the actual H zone, the, the spot where there's only uh, thick filament, only myosin, the H zone's actually gone because here it has been contracted so much that the thin filaments have actually overlapped. And there's no longer an H zone because there is no zone that only contains thick filament. That muscle is so contracted that the entire sarcomere is, is filled with both thin and thick uh, filaments, the actin and myosin. So you can see a totally relaxed muscle where the, the thin fibers are spaced far apart, partially contracted muscle where those thin, the actin filaments, are, are being pulled towards the center, and then a fully contracted muscle where the thin filaments cannot even move any farther. They are as close together as they can, but you can see how the length of this sarcomere, so that one's fully contracted versus this one that's fully relaxed. You can see how that muscle fiber, that sarcomere, contracted or shortened in length. All right, so a little diagram of a muscle contraction and kind of how it works, still not as good as a video but it's better than a bunch of words. So right here, you can see these little purple things. Those are the calcium ions. Let me change color, I don't like yellow. Uh, you can see they've, they've bonded to this blue thing, that's the troponin. Now the trop when, the, when the calcium bonds to the troponin, this, and this whole thing right here, that's a thin fiber, that's the actin fiber. This large brownish reddish, that's the thick fiber, that's the myosin. So once that calcium bonds to the troponin, it's going to cause, this is the tropomyosin, these kind of brownish strings right there. So when calcium bonds to troponin, it causes the tropomyosin to change shape. That's what allows these cross bridges or these heads on the myosin to actually attach to the binding sites on the actin. And they do that with the, with the help of the energy of ATP. All right, so over here you can see both cross bridges. They have attached to the binding site on the actin. Now it's going to release that ADP, and when it does that, it's going to cause these cross bridges to rotate, and that rotation is what's going to pull this actin, that thin filament, towards the middle of the sarcomere. Now, to release those cross bridges, another molecule of ATP is required, and that's what causes the cross bridges to detach from the binding sites on the thin filaments, the actin. And it, if, if more calcium ions are released by the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it can all go over again. Another ATP can, used, can be used to reattach those cross bridges, uh, release the ADP again, and cause another power stroke to make the muscle contract even further. All right, I'm gonna put a little video, about a four minute video at the end of this presentation and I hope it'll make it even more uh, easy to understand. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll talk to you next time.